What up, what up? Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Hope you've been taking a lot of action this week towards your goals, towards your vision. If you're trying to come out with a new e-commerce product or you're trying to raise money for your startup company or you're trying to even just raise money for a nonprofit organization, my podcast is meant to do a couple of things. You know, obviously I want to educate, bring to you just super useful tips, advice, techniques, resources, tools to add to your toolbox. I think that when you're trying to do something, trying to accomplish something, you're honestly only as good as the tools that you have access to. I mean, even the greatest carpenter in the world, if you don't have access to a hammer or a filing, or you don't have access to a saw, it's going to be really hard to do your job right, right? So you need to know about those critical cutting edge tools that are available to you and also the techniques that are going to help you be way more effective. So that's really the, the core purpose of my show. But in addition, I think a nice byproduct is that every single week, you're just thinking about it. You're surrounding yourself with positive voices and people who are out there doing what you want to do. And you're seeing those results. That's something that is so inspirational to me and something that's such a deep rooted passion for me is to show you that this is happening. And I'm not just talking about it. I'm bringing these people on the show. Every single episode, incredible creators, artists, entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors, people who are coming on here and telling you, yes, this is possible. Every single episode I ask at the end of it, what is the message for the audience? And almost everyone says, just get started, right? And you can listen to them say that. So go and listen to some of the other episodes if you haven't yet in today's podcast. I produce this on a few different channels. I produce this on iTunes. I produce this on Spotify. I produce this on YouTube. Wherever you're listening, I really appreciate you. And I think actually today's episode is super cool because we're going to get a lot of interesting insights. So first of all, we talked with a Indiegogo campaign, which has raised over 140K on Indiegogo. And they also did a Kickstarter campaign for over 128K. So this is a great example of someone making use of both of the platforms, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, which I really like. But in addition, you're going to hear about something that just isn't really discussed very much in general, which is as seen on TV products. Okay, now hear me out here. When it comes to creativity, a lot of people like to throw around that word creativity, right? They're so creative, man. Things are so interesting. What I think creativity is, and I did a whole video on this on my YouTube channel, is it's really about connecting different pieces of a puzzle. And in some ways, relating those things. And I think that Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and I've said this for so long, has a lot in similar. There's a lot that's similar between that and crowdfunding and also as seen on TV products. Because the faster you can show someone how something works, you, the faster you can show the benefits, the functionality, the before and after, the more buy-in you get, the more that someone gets excited, they get curious, they want to learn more. And they have that oh so special aha moment where they're like, I want to become a backer of this campaign. And that's exactly what happened with today's guest. Uh, and you'll hear about that on the show, learning a tiny bit about this new industry and also how that relates to an older industry, if you will. So in addition, I'll give you a really quick link before we get started. So for those of you who just joined, I do a newsletter every single week that you should definitely check out where I send out killer crowdfunding tips, completely free, golden nuggets delivered right to your email inbox. And you can check that out at crowdcrux.com slash newsletter. Again, that link is crowdcrux.com slash newsletter. Again, that's crowdcrux.com slash newsletter. The second major link that I got for you, and honestly, I think this is, I don't even know if they're talking about this anywhere. Some of the things that teachings that I'm included in this, I'm doing this workshop. And basically, I kind of wanted to just pull back the hood and share with you exactly what goes into a successful launch. And more than that, what all these other campaigns that I'm studying are doing conversations I'm having behind the scenes. So if you want access to that, it's a free class, man. You can go and book that and you can attend that workshop. It's just definitely something that's like a two minute video, right? This isn't like a you know five second TikTok or something like that. This is an in-depth workshop that you should treat with the educational kind of component. So I definitely would bring a notepad. I'd really think about this and really just set aside some time to be able to process what I'm talking about on this class because it will change your life. So again, the link for that one is crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. Okay, that link, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash masterclass, crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. Go and check out that link and you can learn a ton about what goes into these campaigns. Anyway, I've been talking way too much. Let's get into today's episode and learn how this episode, this project was able to raise over 140K with crowdfunding and it's coming up right after this. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to 
Getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. We have a two-time Kickstarter creator on the show with their most recent project. have been raised over 128000 on Kickstarter for a really interesting smart broom four-blade quadruple clean power. And they've also attracted over 1,000 backers for this project. And we're lucky enough to have a member of the team here on the show. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Salvador. Thanks for having me. Definitely, man. So I'd love to get started. Maybe you could just tell the listeners a bit about your first foray into Kickstarter and kind of how that led to this new project as well. Yes, absolutely. So my company, we are basically a, I guess we're just a modest distribution and business development company. And the first product that we did was, well, I would say about five years ago. At the time, I didn't really know anything about crowdfunding back then. I, it was a thing I had heard about it. We were always brick and mortar distribution. So I wanted to learn more about crowdfunding. So launched a product on Indiegogo. It didn't turn out very well, but I did learn a few things about the experience. And actually some good things did come about from it, I guess five, six years later. From that experience with Roombie, our latest, we did some things differently and found some found some pretty good, pretty good success this time. So for that first project, you know. What was one learning lesson that you took from that that you feel like would help some of the listeners or some of the people that are kind of tuning in here? What, why do you feel like that didn't work for you? Well, we sort of DIY'd the whole thing at the time. Didn't do any sort of pre-marketing, made the video on our own. Didn't really have any expectations. We didn't know what we were getting into. So it was sort of like a learning experience. So I would say that now we know that, you know, a lot of pre-marketing is very important, having any good launch at the beginning. Um, at the time, we didn't do that. And so there was no blast at the beginning. There was no lift. It never really got any traction, although it was a very good product. So things sort of cascaded. And I think with any online site or including crowdfunding, you need, you need some sort of traction to be lifted up on the rankings, I guess. And that never really happened. So that's one of the things that we learned. and also. We didn't really employ any help or any marketing or anything like that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we, could, we didn't make our page as, as professional as it could have been. Got it. But, but I will say, though, one good thing that did come about it was, was the exposure. We did use that to reach out to other, to other distributors. And eventually, it did get on to uh, home shopping. So that was one good thing that did come about it. So Yeah, that's super cool. And when it comes to these projects, you know, what is your, your role? Are you like the project manager, you're the one who comes up with the idea for the product, do the business side, design side, like what's your sort of role in the project? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, I'm definitely on the business side. For the Broomby, we're more collaborators, partners. The inventor is actually in Korea. So just to give you a little background about the product itself, you know, it was invented in, in Korea just in 2014 and took about four or five years to develop. Eventually came to the first version of it came to market in Asia. 28 it was marketed in Korea and, and Japan predominantly and got onto uh, home shopping there and found some pretty good success. My company partnered with the inventor last year to for the development of a second version, this project that eventually is now eventually got onto Kickstarter. And we collaborated with them on on the design and functionality and for the most part for the sales and marketing portion. So that's predominantly my role. How did you get introduced to the team? Did you find them? Did they reach out to you? How did you guys get into One of my business partners is a friend of the inventor. So that's one of the, that's how we got introduced. But for the most part, you know, we've always been interested in products that are consumer products that are, can help people in their daily lives that are hygienic, sustainable, that are that have appeal to a mass market. Very cool. How long have you been doing your business where you've been working with 
inventors and creators and designers to bring products to market? For about uh, 15 years now, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> we like working with smaller companies, with companies that have unique products. And like I said, that are more, that are sustainable, eco-friendly, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Cool, cool. So when it comes to this specific project, for those that can't see this in front of them, how would you describe this product to them? Who is it for? It appeals to a mass market, I would say. The way to describe it is the multifunctional silicon broom, and it's mainly for, for indoor use. Okay, so it's a patented product. We have patents both on the design and the utility. It can be used on smooth surfaces. It can be used actually on rugs as well. It can clean a variety of different messes, liquids, glass, hair, hair, human hair, fine dust. It, it, it looks like a simple product, but actually there was you know, quite a bit of technology behind it. In the R&D process, there was a lot of work with different types of materials, different types of compounds, and you know, they came up with the right blend of material that has the right amount of flex, the right to mold adhesion to the floor, the durability. And one of the actually cool things about it is that when you use it, it's, it elicits a static electricity. So static electricity will attract dust to it. So that's one of the cool features about it. And also the frame, when you look at the frame, it's an open frame that allows air to pass through it so that it doesn't disperse the dust as you're sweeping. So while it may look like a simple product, there was actually quite a bit of R&D and technology behind it. And what, what I like about the product is that it's, it's I consider it eco-friendly in, in a sense that there are no refills that are being used. Um, there's, yeah, no, yeah. there's no waste. There's no detergents that have to be used. It's fully recyclable. It looks super cool too, man. It looks like it's something out of the future, honestly. I love it. Blendable, flexible, you know, you got the works going on there. I could definitely see also your TV background, or at least the way in which it's sort of described there in the video, kind of does seem like home shopping network a little bit. So I just have a couple questions for you, and then we can kind of get into the Kickstarter. How would you say that your experience with like the home shopping network and brick and mortar distribution, how does that compare to the online game that you have to play in terms of selling online? Well, that's a different it's a different animal. You know, in the in home shopping, you need a Need a product that's demonstrable. What's that mean? That means that you know a product using these big words here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So that means products that have appeal when you demonstrate it. For example, our type of product, when you look at it on a shelf at a brick and mortar store, it, it might not the appeal that it has when it's on, let's say, uh, home shopping or even online, where you can show videos and you know, different settings uh, for the product. So you got to see it in action. Yeah. You have to see it in action, and that's one of the most important things that, that home shopping networks are, are looking for are products that are demonstrable, and also, you know, products that fit their market for the most. So, so I, you know, this the Broombe is a very good product for home shopping for products that need demonstration and fits really fits the market for for home Got shopping. It. And just so that people understand your background, because I think you obviously have been in this industry for a long time. When you're working on like a home shopping network deal, how many products is that selling when you get on uh, you know, a time slot there and you have people watching it? Like, What is that like, those sales? It depends on the product. They have certain uh, goals that, you would, that they want you to, certain expectations depending on the product. In fact, they bring it down to actually the minute. They expect you know, certain sales per minute in, in the time allotted. And if you could achieve those goals, then you know you're invited back to another session, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so they're, you know, they have goals. It's not just putting it on there, hoping for the best. They, they have, they have, they have formulized it. They really formulized what their expectations are in terms of the product. That's cool. What's like the biggest project that you've worked on in terms of revenue or in terms of product you sold using that distribution method? So we haven't had. A lot of products on home shopping. The, the last product that we did have was a bed vac. I know that sounds kind of boring, but a bed vac that actually has really, it was also very demonstrable, very good when you demonstrate it. Uh, a bed vac with, with a UV light on it that, that can actually destroy dust mites. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Which is very good for, which is very good for people with allergies. That's actually how I got attracted to that product. Is, Helps people. You know, yeah. 
it, help, it helps people. That's you know, one of the things. That... What kind of sales or like how many products you get sold when you're on in a spot like that? So that one sold every time we were on, I believe it was about 500 units per session. So it's a big ticket item, meaning that, you know, it's over, it was over a hundred dollars for the retail price. So items like that are, we have different parameters as compared to a smaller, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, he's doing at least six figures, like in that, in that kind yeah. of range ish. That's awesome, man. So it's really interesting to me because that's like old school marketing, at least to my generation, but you think of like, have you ever seen the movie joy? Yeah, I've heard about that? it. Yes. 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 You got to watch that movie. Yeah. That's all about that. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, yes. So, so, but you know, home shopping, you know, I know it's sort of like a forgotten, forgotten channel, a forgotten uh, channel for sales, but actually it's still very powerful. <laughs> very, 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 very powerful. And a nice base so what, of customers that watch that. So, so, so when they do their listing on a home shopping network, they open it up for certain sales for a certain period of time. Right. Correct. They, they'll slot you for uh, a few shows and, and if you can meet those goals and they'll plan, plan for more, they don't like to do it time and again. So they want to give some, you know, they want to have some time in between shows for most of these products to see how it performs, to see return rates, see, to get feedback and, and, and things like that. So, you know, once you can meet all those types of goals, then uh, you're invited back to do more shows. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that has a lot in common with Kickstarter because that's also a, a period where you're on this thing for 30 days, right? So there are some similarities in a sense. Correct, correct. It, in a sense, in the sense that you have to show the product, it has to be demonstrated very well in your campaign page. You know, much like home shopping, you have to show the, the features and the benefits of it succinctly, very, very nicely in, in the campaign page in order to attract. Yeah, what made you decide to try? another time with crowdfunding when the first time didn't go as well like what really made that decision for you so this product like i said it, it launched in asia korea and japan and while it was really successful over there we wanted to bring it to north america and sometimes you know products that are successful in asia may not translate well to the North American market or vice versa. So we looked at we looked at crowdfunding as a way to try to validate this product in North America, to try to to get feedback, to see, just to see, gauge the reaction. And we thought that crowdfunding would be a very effective way to do that. Because you have a lot of early adopters on crowdfunding sites and the backers there, and they're very willingly give good feedback. So yeah, I mean, they're they're super stoked. They're excited. They want to be a part of the community for sure. What did it feel like, like the day before you went live? You have this past experience, this negative experience with crowdfunding. The day before you go live, what does that feel like for you? That night that you're just kind of waiting for the campaign to go live the next day? That's a very good question. You know, there's anticipation and there's also not being so experienced in it. It's just the unknown, not knowing what really what to expect. You know, we did do a lot more pre-marketing for this campaign. We engaged friends and family and did a lot of advertising. Facebook, we created a, a, a web page to, to gather emails and information from people that were were interested in this in the project before launch, but still it was, I guess, sort of nervous anticipation, mm -hmm. just not knowing really what to expect. But yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, we, yeah. And, and then that first couple of days, once you do finally go live, what happened? The first couple of days, we did a, a, a big blast of emails, so hundreds of emails from you know friends and family and all the engaging in our circle of people that we know to put the word out, which is not something that we did the first time around. And that really helped us to get a, a boost. And also the first couple of days, something that I was, that didn't happen the first time was, you know, since we started to get quite a bit of sales in the first day, we actually made our goal in, in a couple of days. We were really inundated with, and I was surprised, but I was really inundated with companies that wanted to to work with us a lot of marketing companies that wanted to help us promote our product and so that was a, a little bit overwhelming yeah yeah overwhelming and the prop the in hindsight the prop our campaign lasted for 30 days and i know that's one of these for for kickstarter they say that's 
sort of the, the optimal time to have a campaign. But I think if you're first starting out, it, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of a longer campaign because if you, when you first start, like I said, you're getting inundated by all these marketing companies and, and people that want to collaborate with you. And then it ta- it'll take you a, a good week or so just to filter through all of that and, and sort of you know vet, vet these companies and see which ones are right for you. And then when you yeah. do start to work with them, you know, by that time, you only have two weeks left in, in, in the campaign. I think if you're not uh, better into to crowdfunding, it might be better to uh, have a little bit of a longer campaign just just to give yourself you know time to to work with these people and why why do you think it's so important to keep in touch with your backers and to follow up with a lot of your customers and you kind of use this word like a mini opportunity i was kind of curious if you could expand on that yeah absolutely so you know like i said one of the main things you want to do was to get feedback from every single person you know when you get feed when somebody approaches you and and that means they're interested in their product whether it's good or bad you want to know what you want to hear from. And so, you know, many of the people that we got in touch with directly, they really complimented the product. They loved the product. They said they can't afford the product to come to market and they were looking to support us. And many of them also said that they would be telling all their friends. So, you know, I'm a big believer in in the power of word of mouth. And I really think that, you know, it start it all starts with one person. You start with one person and another person, that person tells another person. And I think that the experience that they have, that they get from interaction with us, not only to acknowledge their feedback, but, you know, to make them feel sort of, like you said, a part of the campaign to make them feel important. I think that that, that not only for us is helpful in getting feedback, but also to, like I said, it's a mini opportunity for them to use them as a, not use them, but, you know, a relationship to help get the word out about our product. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a big opportunity for sure. You never know. <laughs> The person that who that person is that is behind the the comment and you know some of the most I guess innocuous or low, or low key comments or messages that we received were actually from distributors that were very interested in our products. So you, know, you can't leave any un- stone unturned. You have to see what's there because there you never know what kind of who is behind the message, who you're talking to. You know that every person can lead to an opportunity. Just to kind of go down that point, because you have a lot of experience here when it comes to working with distributors. Can you just kind of shed a little bit of light on how that works? So a lot of these distributors are messaging you, right, in order to help sell your product. So are you sell, eventually going to sell the product in bulk to them, and then they're going to distribute it to retailers? Is that kind of how that works? Or Correct, correct, correct. So a lot, of, actually a lot of the uh, inquiries that, that we received came from outside of of the United States. So we, we have inquiries from um, different countries. So when, when working with distributors, it's more of on a, they'll be, they would be an importer and they would take products in bulk and distribute it into retailers, into their, to their local markets. And they are basically getting a better price than you would sell to a retailer or through retail outlets. And they're buying it in bulk. Is this like usually a thousand unit orders or what you usually find as a minimum order that they're going to buy? So, yes. So there I would be purchasing at, at an FOB price, which means the price that is uh, the price that is right out of the factory before it gets onto a container and shipped to the country. So, so there's, you know, there's actually a different couple layers to this. There's the distributor, importer, distributor that would purchase in bulk at the FOB price. And once they do receive the product, then they would in turn be wholesaling it to 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 different retailers. You know, for example, like a Target or Bed Bath and Beyond or other retailers uh, like that. So so there's a couple uh, of different layers. And they're kind of taking on the risk, it sounds like, of having number one, all those that inventory, right? And they also have the relationships with these retailers who they're wholesaling to is what you're saying. Correct, correct. They they are taking on the risk of, of having inventory, of marketing it and selling inventory as well. But uh, that's you know that's sort of the nature of a distributor. They understand these uh, types of risks. That's why they usually purchase in smaller quantities at first, to test market it, and then when if the reaction is good, then, you know gradually orders will increase. And do you find that they're you know buying at like a five hundred? unit kind of order or like a thousand do you have any ideas of that you can give to the audience 
it depends on the market and the situation. But ideally, we'd like to at least sell to them anywhere between 1,000 to 5,000 units initially. You know, bringing the product over from overseas, it's it could be cost more costly for them actually to purchase in smaller quantities, even though they may want to test market it just because of the of the shipping costs involved. And, you know, these, these shipping costs are really high also. So that's another factor. Yeah, especially with all the supply chain issues and everything that's everything that's been happening recently, right? Correct, correct. Yes, it's, it's the supply chain has gotten pretty sort of out of hand these last few years. Yeah, and then I assume with the distributors is also based on geographic area. So you can't have two that are competing. Otherwise, it might be cannibalize your sales a bit there. Yes, correct. So distributors, they you know, many of them, of course, they want to have exclusive rights to your product, and that's understandable. We want to help the distributor be as successful as possible. So you know, having two or three may not always be, make sense in the market. We want to, for we sure, want to work, for sure. We want to work with a good distributor that that has that has a track record, a good track record that's you know trustworthy, because uh, it has to be. There has to be trust between you and the distributor. And one, you yeah, want to have definitely. a good working relationship with them for sure. So I just have one or, one or two more questions here. So first of all, you have a lot of really cool experience. Why I'm asking you so much, so many questions here is I think it's really invaluable for people that want to see the larger picture. So doing a Kickstarter, doing a crowdfunding campaign can get you in touch with distributors who can help sell your products even more after the fact of doing this mega online campaign where you've been able to track over 100k in funding. Do you have any other advice or tips you'd like to pass on when it comes to Kickstarter specifically that you think could be useful for someone who's just kind of getting started? I think the campaign is won or lost even before you start. You know, from our, from our past experience, where we did no marketing, you know, that didn't go very well. But this time, we like I said, we ran a good email list. We started advertising um, on Facebook. We created a web page as a landing page. I and mean, we really wanted to have a big blast at the beginning because, you know, once once you start gaining momentum, there's more people that want to work with you, more people that approach you for to have cross, cross promotion, promotion on your product. The more people come and visit your campaign and purchase, I think the higher you, you go up on organically on the Kickstarter ranking page. So, you know, although we did do a fair amount of advertising and, and marketing, most of our backers came from, you know, organically looking at our product through, through, the, through the Kickstarter page. And that was because we had a good lift in the beginning. So, so that, that's one important thing. And I would say that the other important thing is you've got to have a, an attractive campaign page that really can translate your, the benefits of your product right at the beginning if you look at our page it's there's got there's a lot of information but for the most part you understand what the product is right in the first you know first few even from the title to the first i would say i don't know quarter of the page you, you really can understand what the product is and you know like i said it, our product is something that has to be demonstrated so we, we put a lot of videos mini videos not too long just very short videos and gifs that can really you know, show effectively show what our product does. And then, if, you know, if people are backers are more just to double down and read, read in more detail and whatnot. So, you know, obviously you have to have a well-designed page with, with good information right off the bat and the pre-marketing. And yeah, so, and, and also getting back to your backers, the feedback, you know, quickly, yeah. they really appreciate that. And like I said, you never know who you're talking to. It could turn out to be somebody very, very uh, beneficial. Yeah, definitely. A lot of, lot of opportunity. So one other question I had for you is, you know, first of all, this is a lot of great advice on Kickstarter. I really appreciate you being candid on your first failure. And now you had a success. So that's awesome. Have you ever seen a product in the wild that you've worked with before? And by that, I mean, like, in a store or seeing people carry it or use it? Have you ever had that experience? Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of the products that we have is actually a food service food service mask. So it's, it's a product that's really, really popular in, in Korea. And we brought this product out to to North America a few years and started marketing this. And, and the sales were actually very, did quite well, more than our expectations. And as I'm walking <laughs> walk around, as I walk around to different shopping malls, I've seen several people with this, with using our item. So that, that was kind of uh, a real kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
That's so cool, man. Yeah, how it does was, that feel? Uh, so kind of surreal. I've never, I've never thought I'd, I'd see that. But you know, I've seen it. You know, they say, "Hey, where did you get that mask?" And they would, and they would say, oh, "I got it." You know, I'm, I'm just side, and, and I say, "I know that mask," and, and they would, and they would say, uh, "I really love this mask." And so that was, you know, those, those kind of interactions are, are kind, of, kind of cool. Yeah. Super, super cool. So my, my final question for you is, you've been doing this for so long, it sounds like, and being in the brick and mortar distributor kind of game, now you're getting into e-commerce and Kickstarter and crowdfunding. What is the most, or what do you find passionate about this? Like, what do you really enjoy? Why do you keep doing this? Is most rewarding to you about this process? You know, the most rewarding thing I would say is to bring new products that are useful and helpful to people, products that are, that are, it was sustainable, you know, eco-friendly, healthy for people. Things that help our lives, things that are not out there but can improve our lives. That's, I think, the most rewarding thing to me is to find a product, identify it, bring it to market, and have people accept it, and have them sort of agree with, you know, my vision of what this product was intended to be. That's I find that to be the most yeah, thing. love it, yeah. But, but- yeah, I imagine that's a super cool feeling. Final question for you is, you know, if you could, first of all, where can people go to learn more about Broomby? But also, we can end on this note, if you want to leave the viewers, the listeners with a final word of encouragement, who someone who's just getting started on the first product idea, it could be a bit of advice, it could be a final tip, anything like that, we can end on Yeah, that absolutely. Note. So the product, our product, you can go to our webpage, which is broomby.com. It's actually also running on Indiegogo in demand right now. We're waiting for inventory to, to come into before we can actually sell it uh, on our webpage. But we are taking three orders, I would say. So Boomby.com. One piece of advice, you know, I would say, even though you feel you're not ready and you don't know everything, it's, you know, learn it, of course, learn as much as you can beforehand, but, but you just gotta dive in. You know, you just gotta dive in and, and just really just do it. You know, just you know, there's, it's a learning experience. You gain so much, even though, regardless of of whether you fail or succeed in your campaign, there are things that you will pick up that will help you. You know, in the future, in our case, obviously, it helped us. So, you know, I would say just dive in, get help from your from your peers, from other people, listen to other others' opinions, listen to the feed. But uh, you know, just don't be afraid to jump in. Got it. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming on. Really appreciate all of your tips and advice. Good luck with your product here. Looks like it's doing amazing. And hopefully when you do the next campaign, we can have you back on the show as well. Thank you very much, Salvador. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. Thank you so much for your time and attending today's class when it comes to the podcast and just kind of taking away a lot of good stuff when it comes to what works right now on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and using that kind of dual strategy, which we've been talking about more and more. In addition, uh, I think we took a lot of good things away when it comes to what works in order to get people to take action and kind of how that also relates to sometimes older industries like as seen on TV style products. And that's really what I like to do is just kind of connect the dots for you, kind of help you connect those dots. When I was younger, I always hated doing puzzles. But the cool thing is that as you get older, you can actually get help completing those puzzles. And then that puzzle is figuring out how to market your product. That puzzle could be figuring out even what you should make. Should you even go on Kickstarter, Indiegogo? Is this something that is going to be worth your time? All those kinds of things you can get help with. And that's the coolest thing about business. So it's actually one of the things that I help individuals with. And we do this with an intensive coaching call. So basically go in depth, super long, you know, basically going through the entire inner workings of your campaign, understanding your project. Is this something that you should be moving forward with? And if you are, what do you have to do in order to be successful? And here's the cool thing is that while we talk a lot about generalities on this show and you do bring on like physical products and games and we talk about video games as well, creative projects, artistic projects, et cetera. The interesting thing is that every category is different. And that's also true of the principles that make you successful. So when I'm doing these coaching calls, they're really tailored to the individual. And that's really why, you know, I think it's worth a really good investment is it sets you off right on a really strong foundation. And you don't then have to worry about what you got to do. And to be honest, if you're doing, for example, some marketing techniques when it comes to a physical product category, and you're trying to apply that to the board game category, doesn't always work. 
Same thing for vice versa. If you've been learning a lot about board games and you're like, I want to do a physical product that's not related to that, unfortunately, some of the things you might have learned might not apply and some of them will, right? So that's kind of my job with these coaching calls is to really set you straight and to help you understand what you need to do to be successful and to arm you with those tools and resources in order to do that. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to this link and you can learn more about that. You can fill out this form and I can also begin to study a little bit of what you are doing. So go and check out this link, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Again, that link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you took a lot of value out of today's episode and I will see you next time.